Um, so it doesn't get the mixing as much. So it's a little easier, it's a little more accurate when it comes down to uh, scientific stuff. I won't get into the details of how all that works. Okay, <laughs> but basically, um, haplogroup X is different. It was spotted by Taroni. He was a, uh, he's one of the big DNA guys over in Europe. In a, in a small number of European populations. Okay, down here he says, uh, when they did this, they analyzed blood samples from Native Americans, Euro, uh, European and Asian populations, and reviewed published studies. We fully expected to find it in Asia, like the other four American markers, says Brown. To their surprise, however, Haplogroup X was only confirmed in the genes of a smattering of living people in Europe and Asia Minor, including Italians, Finns, and certain Israelis. So again, Israelis. Now this is uh, actually, you can't read it quite up at the top here, but this is from the American Journal of Physical Anthropology. By the way, not an LDS journal. <laughs> okay. Um, the name of it is the distribution of mitochondrial DNA in haplogroup X among Native North Americans. Right here, it says the wide distribution of this haplogroup throughout North America and its prehistoric presence there are consistent with it being a fifth founding haplogroup exhibited, exhibited <coughs> excuse me, by about 3% of modern Native Americans. Wow. We're talking haplogroup X. This is Israeli DNA being found in native North Americans. Okay. This is uh, some of the other uh, quotes in regard to that. I'll just read a couple of things here. Um, right here. Uh, let's see, it's in the Navajo people. Haplogroup X was present in five of the six Algonquin Algonquin speaking tribal groups studied in frequencies ranging from 7 to 40 percent of their tribe had haplogroup X. This is, the, this is the Israeli style or European DNA. In the Algonquin tribe, uh, the Chippewa and this, uh, demonstrates its presence throughout this widely distributed language group. The apparent antiquity of haplogroup X is, is such in such geographically and or logistically dispersed tribal groups is consistent with its status as a founding Native American uh, matriline. Okay, that's matriline comes from the word from the mitochondrial DNA. Okay, next. This is continued from that same article. He says that haplogroup X is present in five of the six Algonquin speaking tribal groups studied in frequencies ranging from 7 to 40 percent, okay? Haplogroup X has now been reported in contemporary members of, and here are some of the groups. Curiously, haplogroup X is found in modern populations of Europe and southern Asia, but not in those of central Siberia. This was a very large consternation, okay, for uh, modern scientists because this goes against the Bering Strait theory, because all of a sudden there is European DNA showing up right in downtown United States, okay, with, uh, with this information. Now, based on the results of this study, it seems likely that modern samples assigned in either studies to other were also uh, haplogroup X. Okay, next. This is from U.S. News and World Report in 2001, where we came from. Here, Emery Wallace, newest and most surprising discovery is a set of genetic markers found only in the Ojibwa and other tribes living near the Great Lakes. The markers are not found in any other Native Americans or in Asia. We just don't know how it got there, Wallace says, but it's clearly related to the European population. The simple answer would be that the DNA arrived from European colonists. In other words, that when after Columbus arrived, that they intermixed, and that's why the present day Indians have some of this European DNA. But as it turns out, that the strain is different enough from the existing European lineage that it must have left the old world long before Columbus. Okay, next. Um, this is brief communication from American Journal of Physical Anthropology in 2002. 
Again, this is long after these two books had been written. Um, and basically what this does is they go through um, and right, let's see, right here, okay, they're talking about haplogroup X confirmed in prehistoric North America. This means they confirmed that haplogroup X, they, they took some old remains and they confirmed that the haplogroup X DNA did exist long before Columbus ever set foot in the Americas. And so they, they, they found, a, there was a guy there that they used as their primary guy that was found along the Columbia River, okay? Um, then he says, we confirmed the presence of haplogroup X in one prehistoric sample excavated at a site in the Columbia River near Vantage, Washington. And to the best of our knowledge, this is the first evidence of haplogroup X in prehistoric America to be confirmed using both control region markers and the diagnostic restriction site gain in the coding region. This verifies a prehistoric presence of haplogroup X in North America. Pretty exciting stuff. <laughs> okay. This is from the American Journal of Human Genetics, 2003. Origin and diffusion of mitochondrial DNA from haplogroup X. Again, this one basically what they're expl explaining is that uh, there is two sets of haplogroup X DNA that is found in Europe. One they called X1, one they called X2. X1 is primarily in Africa. X2 is in Europe, Western and Central Asia, Siberia, and the great majority of the, in the Near East. Pretty interesting. Uh, it is noticeable, they, th they said, that these, by the way, are all quotes. These are not words that I put on it. Every single one, that, everything that you've been seeing so far are all quotes directly from these journal articles. If you'd like to take a look at them, I'd be happy to show you the articles right here. Okay. So very quickly, the results of this study point to the following conclusions. First, the haplogroup X variation is completely captured by two ancient clades. X1 is largely restricted to that, and of course then X2 is in West Eurasia. Second, it is apparent that the Native American haplogroup X mitochondrial DNA derived from X2 by a unique con to, uh, combination of five mutations. That, folks, places this haplogroup X DNA in, that they say is from the Near East, places it in America. And finally, the Near East is the, is the likely geographical source for the spread of haplogroup X2. The presence of a daughter clade in, North, uh, in Northern uh, Native Americans testifies to the range of this population expansion. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. Go ahead. This is from Evolutionary Anthropology in 2000 and something. I can't read that kind of there. And three, okay. Mitochondrial DNA studies of Native Americans, concepts, conceptions and misconceptions. Okay, and basically the main thing about this is that uh, they showed the presence of haplogroup X, that they're associated with the Europeans again, and then, um, let's see, Though presently thought to be the most common among speakers, Algonquin languages, haplogroup X, which reaches a frequency of 20% in some Algonquin populations, is geographically widespread throughout North America. Sequences of virtually, are virtually identical to those of modern Algonquins from the Great Lakes region, confirmed in the members, excuse me, confirmed to be members of haplogroup X. <laughs> okay, and go ahead. Okay, this is last slide. This is from last year, folks. You're getting the latest information. This American Journal of Physical Anthropology. Is haplogroup X present in extant, that means modern day, South American Indians? Take a read about right there. The results indicate that haplogroup X is not present in these samples. The evidence presented here strongly supports the hypothesis that haplogroup X is likely absent in modern native South American populations. That tells me something. If this haplogroup X is Nephite DNA, it's not being found today in Central America. So that is a little bit of information about that, I will turn the time back over to Wayne. Thanks, Rod. Thank you.
because I can't pick up anything and tell you this is definitely a Book of Mormon thing, a Book of Mormon place, but I can show you the data, as I told you from the beginning, that the data of the Hopewell people that are identified in North America and in particularly around the Great Lakes, Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, Wisconsin, Western New York, fits what we call this parallel in time. Hopewell culture, we know is really firmly established at 300 BC, but all the archaeologists agree by 400 AD, the Hopewell culture is over. It is no longer to be found in the archaeological record of North America. And this is my personal choice for Hopewell Central, as I call it, or Nephite Central, is Ohio, right here. Every little dot here you see is a Hopewell site. Hundreds, thousands. There are three types of earthen enclosures. We're going to show them all to you. This one is the most common. They're small and they're scattered all over the place. This black line on the outside is a ditch. And the white line is the earth bank that's been thrown up from the ditch. This is the size of them. These are the most numerous. I simply call them the small earthworks. Next one. This is a fortified hilltop. These people would find hilltops and they would climb the top of them and they would turn them into a fortified citadel using the natural geographic things that were afforded to them, such as height and distance for view. This particular one here has over 33 breaks in the walls. This is the place of entrance, which we're going to highlight here just in a minute. But this, this covers uh, 40, about 48 acres. It's two and a half miles all the way around. And this is a hill fort, or in a Book of Mormon, a place of resort, a place to run to. The villages are down in the valley floor, but in time of trouble, you go up to the hilltop fort and secure yourselves. Next one. Then we find these geometric works. We now know that the Hopewell people understood surveying. They had high math, and they knew how to build earthen earth banks to last for time because they have lasted. You're going to see real pictures. But look at the geometric shapes. Now what's very neat about this, if you were to take the geometric earthworks throughout Ohio and lump them together for an average date for timeline when they were built, the average date comes out around 125 to 150 A.D. And that is so important for the Book of Mormon. Why do you think that's important? What was going on in the Book of Mormon at 150 A.D.? Who had showed up at 34 A.D.? Jesus. And then we have this golden era of the Nephite timeline which lasted for about 200 years, which means the Nephites and Lamites were now trade partners. It tells us great commerce was taking place at this time. And that meant stability of population. Warfare was not at the top of the list. This gave the people time to build very neat, unusual earthworks. And that's when all the geometric works were built was during this 200 timeline period from the Book of Mormon, which is when the Hopewell, for the parallel time match, all built during this safe time, the golden time of the Book of Mormon, that 200 years after Christ had visited the Nephites and reestablished the church. Next one. Alma 49, 4 and 5. How great was their disappointment. That's the Lamanites. For behold, the Nephites had dug up a ridge of earth round about them, which was so high that the Lamanites could not cast their stones and their arrows at them that they might take effect. Neither could they come upon them, save it was by the place of entrance. Now two things I want to point out here. Number one is the word cast. The Lamanites, whatever they're doing with their arrows, they were casting. They were not shooting like a bow to draw it back. You go in to look at Alma, or excuse me, in the third Nephi, when Samuel showed up and they're trying to pick him off the walls, excuse me, his book of Helaman, and they're trying to shoot Alma off the walls, it says the Nephites were shooting arrows. But the Lamanites cast their arrows. And we're going to demonstrate that to you. And then he, 